Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's podcast, Head to Toe. My name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the college's heritage manager. My name's Olivia Howarth and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we have made it as far as the armpit. Now I'm quite enjoying this to start off with because I think the armpit is not a body part that people necessarily would expect that we would even bother with. We we do the, we'll do the big hitters, you know, the heart, the bladder, the lungs. Let's go slightly rogue yes. and add in an armpit along the way. <laughs> when I was sort of thinking about the armpit, it's much more about what it does. I think from my perspective, it's quite a sweat heavy episode. <laughs> <laughs> a, nice, a nice sweaty episode. <laughs> it, is, it is quite a sweaty. It's a very excretory episode. I'm very sorry. So sweating is very important in a whole bunch of ways. It is a way that they treated you historically. It's a symptom of various things. It's something which they would go to quite a lot of lengths they being doctors predominantly, but also sort of lay people as well, to try and understand where it came from and what it meant. So sweating has a lot of different sort of layers of meaning. One of the things that I have to get out of my system, first of all, before we dig into it, is sweat like a pig. Pigs do not sweat. The term is derived from an actual smelting process where a pig is pig iron. And as the iron cools, the iron sort of sweats. And that indicates that it's cold enough to be handled. So sweating like a pig was nothing to do with the animal pig. So there's a lot of different versions of what sweating actually does for quite a long time. So in the 1400s to 1500s, doctors are often very anti-sweating. The idea that bathing is harmful for you, you should want to clog your pores, you should want to stop things from escaping from your body. Water could soften your skin, it could make you vulnerable to illness. So you would better off lathering yourself in oil or some sort of lard product to make sure the water didn't get to you and that you didn't lose sweat from your body. So that's one version. I'm enjoying your facial expressions, Olivia. (laughs) (laughs) But then on the other hand, and particularly getting a bit later into the 17th, 18th centuries, sweating is used as a treatment. So again, this is the kind of going back to humoral theory, the idea of getting the humours out of the body. So there's not a lot of consistency, basically. It's interesting that they would try and stop sweating. Sweat is kind of an underlying cause of, uh, in their mind, a lot of different things. They understood that cold made the pores contract. And so there's a strong idea in the 18th and even into the early 19th century that being exposed to cold made you ill and it made you ill because it stopped you from sweating. And you see that a lot, the exposure to cold being viewed as a cause of disease. But then on the other hand, you give medicines involving wine or involving pepper with the explicit idea that they cause sweating. I think it's very, very specific, depending on your humour, exactly what they want to happen. So thinking of kind of associations with with sweating, a disease that was very talked about and caused unsurprisingly a huge furor was sweating sickness, which is quite a mysterious disease, which even now scientists haven't really got a handle on what exactly sweating sickness was. So it was also known as English sweating sickness because it was particularly a phenomenon in England. It was sort of from about 1480s up to the mid 1500s. There was a series of epidemics. Large numbers of people died. This is around the same time as the plague, so not quite on the scale of the plague, which may be why it got less press. But it killed tens of thousands of people. And I think the thing that was particularly shocking about it was, first of all, it was very quick. It typically lasted 24 hours. 
And then you either recovered and were, it was as if it had never happened, or you died. So it was not one of these lingering weeks and months diseases. It was very, very quick. It tended to happen in the summer and autumn, and a main symptom was sweating, which, as I understand it, is why it's called sweating sickness. But also there was an idea that if you sweated enough, that would sweat the badness out of you. So they felt that the people who recovered were the ones who sweated the most. I'm not sure that there's necessarily science behind it. But again, it's a bit kind of humoral theory sweating out the poisons. I'm sure we've spoken about it before. Fever fevers to have a cold and sweating things out is still a thing that we do. We can't get away from it. There's something in us that that just feels right. Mm. <laughs> Various people at the time and subsequently have said, you know, was it sewage? You know, because it was more common in the summer, maybe it's something summer related. The heat is therefore causing the sewage, causing the, the sanitation, causing further contamination of water supplies. But one of the reasons that there was this sort of huge wave of fear and paranoia around it was that it didn't seem to be more common amongst the poor. And that's the case with a lot of diseases that were typical of this time, your choleras and so on. Because they were so connected to contamination of water to supply, to built up urban areas, they were often more common amongst the poor. But this seemed to be at least as common and sometimes even more common amongst wealthy people. So it was hitting working age wealthy men particularly, not the very young, not the very old, and not the very poor. And so because this seemed to be very different from all the other diseases people were familiar with, that really confounded people a lot. And there was a huge amount of fear and a lot of wealthy aristocratic people. They left London, they went out into the country, they tried to get as geographically far away as possible. This included Henry VIII, but it was, yeah, it was seen as, as hitting men in their 20s and 30s, particularly nobility. Some people have subsequently suggested influenza, some people have said anthrax, but the collection of symptoms are still baffling. And it has, as far as people know, not recurred since, but maybe it has and it's, t you know, had a different name or taken a slightly different form. I think what's so fascinating about it is it still remains so mysterious today in comparison to plague and cholera, which we have a much stronger grasp of. I mean, they were doing social distancing. <laughs> Flee. Flee and run away. Yeah. <laughs> We talked about before, I imagine it was in the nose episode and possibly in the skin episode as well, we talked about perfumes and about smell and the way people kind of covered up the odours of their body. And this was seen as a very culturally specific thing. So there was, by some, a notion that the British smelt particularly bad. The continent seemed to be stereotyped, at least, of being more likely to wear perfume to cover the smell of the body. And especially in France, there were all sorts of cultural perfumes and objects. So there were sort of perfume rings and there were perfume necklaces. They had little smelling boxes that had perfume in them. This kind of importance of smell was sort of everywhere. And so unfortunately, the British were characterised by comparison as not really paying so much attention to the smell aspect. And I think a lot of the changes around body odour came with changes to clothing. So when we go from Georgian into Victorian, and then obviously then into the 20th century, clothing gets simpler. There are less layers. The material is more likely to be linen or cotton, maybe not so much brocade or silk. You sweat less. And also the clothes that you wear are easier to clean. Yes, there's a wider hygiene thing, sanitation, all that sort of stuff, but also on an individual personal level, you're not just standing there sweating all the time because you've got 15 layers of clothing on, which I'm sure helps. <laughs> I was looking, and it's probably unsurprising that the first commercial deodorants come out of America rather than out of Europe. It's not that nothing like a deodorant existed before. Obviously, going back to Greece and Egypt, there are things that in some way act as deodorizers or scents. But the sort of mass marketed product of a deodorant comes from the late 1800s from America. And apparently these early products were highly acidic and would actually burn people. So not quite what we would think of now. Um, they would damage clothing quite badly and they would often burn the skin. So they wouldn't really live up to today's, does it mark your black dress? Is it good for sensitive skin standards? I would say not. No, does it burn your skin? <laughs> they don't say that in the adverts. But also there's something very interesting about the way that they are marketed. So, of course, these are mass market products. They are in magazines. They are in newspapers. They are being pushed on people because, you know, you have to convince people that they have a body odour problem in order to then get them to buy your products. And they really are marketed very strongly at women. And there's a focus of, you know, do you want people to talk to you? Do you want men to fall in love with you? You should buy our product. And it's only 
only about 40, 50 years later in the 1930s that the first product marketed specifically at men comes out. And what I love about it is it's so 2023 because it's black and it's sleek and it's for men. It looks like Lynx or something, you know, it's that sort of, right, if we're marketing at men, there's a very specific aesthetic that we are going to use to do that. And the focus of that marketing wasn't about having friends or falling in love. It was all about your workplace. So the male marketing was very different. Again, this is an American product. So it's during the Great Depression. It's when men are particularly worried about finding a job, keeping a job and so all the marketing really preys on that so it's a very very different psychology that it's going for trying to get a job in the depression must have been really stressful anyway which then would make you sweat it's that kind of canny marketing where they know your weak spot and they go for it when we look at shaving as well it's a similar sort of mindset shaving armpits is a pretty recent phenomenon. There's a much longer history of shaving legs, shaving heads, shaving other parts, but the armpits is is a pretty modern phenomenon. And it really comes about in the early 20th century, essentially because women's clothing changed. Because up until that point, you would pretty much never see a woman's armpit unless you were incredibly intimate with her and then you get sleeveless dresses and that's really the point when armpit shaving becomes something that's on people's radar and again the need to do that particular shaving is something that is marketed incredibly heavily again there is not a need you have to create a need in order to sell this product and so they have to work to create a kind of shame around this new phenomenon to then make sure that the product is bought and it's Darwinistic. It's sort of an evolutionary thing for women. It is kind of tied into primitivism, not being sort of genteel enough, all sorts of things like that. It's a sign of upper class status. It's a sign of belonging. There was an awful lot on the internet about ancient cave painting showing men removing hair with tweezers. And I'm like, that's very dubious. But ancient Egyptians were pretty pro removing hair for all sorts of reasons. And it was more of a class issue than a gender issue. So if you had body hair or hairiness was associated with being low class, whereas if you were a genteel, noble person, you'd remove all your hair, your head, your legs. And they were using things like pumice stone and sugaring and apparently um, arsenic and quicklime in depilatory creams. I'm amazed how often arsenic comes up in medicine. (laughs) Way more than it should. Way Mm. more than it should. (laughs) Underarm hair now is always remarkable if it's on celebrities. And I have a list of people (laughs) who who have notably appeared without shaved underarms and i know some of them and that's strange because i'm not immersed in celebrity culture but as you say it's notable isn't it yes the one the one that appears everywhere is julia roberts at the premiere of notting hill in 1999 given that that was 24 years ago and it's still being remarked upon as a key moment of someone showing their underarm hair pictures of sophia loren with underarm hair Janelle Monae, Grace Jones, Drew Barrymore, Emily Ratajkowski, Britney Spears, Emma Corrin, Amanda Steinberg, Julia Michaels, Madonna and Barbara Streisand. That was my list. It is interesting that it's such, even now, it is, if not a taboo, at least something that is still surprising and somewhat shocking Hmm. in 2023, for sure. There is a movement of people just letting that, I think it's underarm hair in particular, grow for a month called Jenny Harry. I like it. Yes. <laughs> it still has a value. It still definitely has a value for sure. Mm. In that instance that we all know called the Black Death, it's mostly called the Black Death, but it is called also the bubonic plague, and that gets its name from swollen lymph nodes or buboes, which are caused by the D's, and those nodes are in the groin, the neck, and the armpit. So Thank there is you. a link there. I'm getting, <laughs> I'm, I'm circling background, uh, and they get swollen and become like about the size of an egg and ooze lots of pus. In the 14th century, bubonic plague deaths estimated at around 75 to 200 
million across Eurasia. And some historians suggest that's as much as 60% of the European population. And that's why nobody cared about my disease, sweating sickness, because your yeah. disease is so much worse. <laughs> One of the most popular cures in in quotation marks for the Black Death, just because I find it hilarious, is called the Vickery Method, named after uh, a doctor called Thomas Vickery. A healthy chicken was taken and its back and rear plucked clean. The bare part of the chicken was then applied to the swollen buboes and strapped in place. And when the chicken showed signs of illness, it was thought to be drawing the illness from the person. Um, It was taken off, removed, washed, and then strapped back on until either the chicken or the patient died. I've, I've heard about the idea of an animal t- like taking the disease. and it, I think for some reason it's the plucking of the rear. I haven't come across that before. And that's t- I feel like that's taking it a bit too far. The big idea that you can strap a live chicken to your <laughs> armpit is also um, <laughs> well, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> In our case study today, we're going to look at sweat, and particularly the sweat-related research carried out by Santorio Santorio. Santorio was a Venetian physician in the late 1500s and early 1600s. He was physician to the King of Poland for a time, before returning to Italy to take up the chair of theoretical medicine at the University of Padua. And he carried out experiments there on temperature, on breathing, and on weight. Santorio was fascinated with measuring things and developing new tools to help him do so. He invented a number of scientific devices, including a water current meter, a hydrometer to measure the water content in gas, a thermoscope, which was a device to show changes in temperature, and a device to measure pulse rate. This was quite significant for the time, when a lot of medical teaching was still based on memorising ancient Greek and Roman works, it was pretty unusual for a physician to carry out and publish on their own original experiments and research. Many of Santorio's inventions were detailed in his 1614 publication, titled On Statistical Medicine. Santorio's work encouraged subsequent generations of physicians to become more hands-on in their studies. His greatest achievement was the discovery of insensible water loss. He did this by living for days at a time on a self-made balance. This structure included a chair and a system of weights and pulleys. His weight, everything he ate and drank, and all urine and feces leaving him, was carefully weighed. He then compared his totals, and through this he discovered that for every eight pounds of food he ate, his body only excreted three pounds. He concluded that there was imperceptible perspiration through the skin, which could not otherwise be accounted for. This water loss through the skin is so microscopic that it isn't even visible as sweat. Santorio said there was abundant water in exhaled air, which he demonstrated by breathing on a cold mirror. Santorio's discoveries influenced many of those around him, including the famed Italian astronomer and physicist Galileo. Throughout the 1700s, Researchers continued to build their own weighing chairs across Europe to further the research started by Santorio. This short clip is courtesy of the Welcome Collection and first aired on BBC Radio Sheffield in 1972. Well, it was true in the old days they believed in sewing up their children in red flannel and even sometimes in goose grease and leaving them in that condition for the winter. But we've got to remember that conditions were very different in the old days. We didn't have the kind of homes that we have today. They were drafty and ill-ventilated sometimes. Uh, You've got all sorts of extremes. And people didn't know what we know today. Also, of course, clothing was a very different uh, cup of tea. Not only styles, but the amount that was worn wasn't really very healthful. Remember too that they were limited in the amount of, uh, of range of materials that they had in the old days to choose from for clothing, but today weight isn't the main consideration. 
We have got a wide variety of types of material and styles of material we can choose from according to the season. Uh, if you've noticed over the past few years during the winter, men are wearing very, very lightweight suits, but they're still managing to keep warm, partly because of the good insulating properties of the suit and also because, of course, uh, many buildings now are centrally heated and we don't need to wear outdoor clothes inside. The important thing, I think, is that we've got to dress according to the weather, not according to the date of the year. This old fallacy of summer clothes and winter clothes, I think we can get rid of that for good and all. If we try rigidly to stick to a seasonal sort of dress, I think we're going to be uncomfortable uh, and look rather foolish. If it's cold on a summer day, well, wear warm clothing. The thing that I think we've got to aim for is lightness and insulation. Many people aren't really aware about the effect of clothes from a point of view of keeping you warm. It really isn't the clothes that do it, it's the insulating layer of air between you and the outside world. And some clothes have very, very good insulating properties, particularly the long, hairy, woolly type fibres. It's not the weight, it is this insulating property that's derived from the cloth. Some types of material allow us to sweat very freely and get rid of the moisture that collects in the layer of air between us and the outside world. And it's this sweating that helps us to keep cool. So we've got two sides to it. One, the adequate ventilation of the body to get rid of the perspiration that's coming out in hot weather. And also the maintenance of this warm layer of air to keep us warm when there's a cold snap on. There are a few, if one can call them, rules or wise pointers about clothing at all times of the year. This is that clothing should be changed pretty often, especially underclothing. And in warm weather, uh, we do sweat whilst the moisture may evaporate. Some of the other foosty stuff that comes away uh, stays behind on the surface of the skin and this can begin to pong quite a bit. We get used to our own kind of smell and we notice other people's. Now, it's no good trying to cover it up with uh, deodorants and sweet-smelling things of one kind or another. There's only one way to reduce the smell or get rid of it. This is regular changing of the clothes and regular washing of the surface of the body. This kind of personal fastidiousness, personal freshness is especially important during the summer period, during the warm weather, or at any other time when we're likely to get hot and sweaty. And this, of course, can happen during the winter as well. Now, certainly, we don't want to dress according to the season. Don't wait till May's out to get rid of your winter clothing. Wear clothing that is suitable for the weather. Remember that we can have very rapid changes in the weather, and if somebody's going off early in the morning and it looks like being a bright day, it's still wise to take something warm that one can wear should there be a cold snap. This is particularly true on holidays. Lots of people do spoil their holidays by trying to dress in a holiday kind of garb all the time. Be ready for anything. Our kind of weather is changeable. We've got to be ready to change with it. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today, so it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. The main way the armpits appear in historic medical recipes is in the form of sweat, both trying to prevent sweating and to encourage it. In a 1731 Scottish printed recipe book, Taylor's Ready Doctor, one recipe to encourage sweating was given as, quote, If you want to sweat, take a bottle of strong ale, a glass of gin, two eggs and a little pepper, warmed well together before going to bed. And if you sweat too much, drink about a pint of water that comes off an iron mineral once a day for four days. In another 1700s recipe book, The Poor Man's Physician, one recipe to provoke sweat recommended you, quote, take bricks very hot, wrap them in clothes, and lay them on the feet and sides, or stone bottles put into boiling water and filled therewith, being well stopped with corks and fast bound at the head, use them as bricks. 
Another way of inducing sweating, and this becomes a bit of a common theme, involves alcohol. Take a handful of thistle leaves and boil them in a muchkin of ale or beer, till it be boiled into the half. Then strain them into a gill of treacle, and it will occasion sweating. The treacle will make it pleasant to drink. A muchkin is a measurement which works out at about three quarters of a modern pint, and a gill is about a quarter of a pint. Finally, another recipe from the poor man's physician, this time to prevent night sweats, involved taking a mixture of mint, cream of tartar, and syrup of apples twice a month. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.